Final matter from the floor today is State of Ohio versus Paul Brewer. Both sides will have 15 minutes to argue. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you are the appellant and wish to reserve any time for rebuttal, if you let me know when you get started, I am keeping the clock and I can keep you apprised of the passage of time. We've read the briefs and we'll be ready to proceed when you are. For and thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is uh, Stephen Hannadel. I represent the appellant, uh, Paul Brewer. Uh, Mr. Brewer was convicted of one count of uh, failure to register, and the state presented evidence that the, the state accused him of changing his residence and not reporting that to the county sheriff. Um, I think there's a lot of problem with the state's case, especially because they used testimony from from a parole officer from the Ohio from the Ohio Adult Parole Authority who was supervising Mr. Brewer on, on post police control from a totally separate case. And the reporting obligations for a PRC for PRC post police control are much different than registering as a sex offender with the county sheriff. But the, it's my understanding there was a limiting instruction, at least one limiting instruction given to the jury regarding that testimony and its utilization. I don't think that was good enough um, because there, it's, uh, yeah, the, the judge could get the living instruction, but all the jury is hearing that, oh, he's not reporting, he's not fulfilling his obligations. And it's very easy to mix up the two obligations of reporting to the APA for PRC versus reporting to the sheriff about where your residence is for sex offender registration purposes. Um, the, the standards and obligations are completely different. The conditions are completely different. Um, the requirement with the sheriff only that just means you got to just keep you just got to keep them updated as to where you're living. That's it. Um, and if you change your address, then you got to tell them. And and that's where the, it, it brings other problems. That law brings other problems in this case. You know, I'll get into shortly. But then, meanwhile, with PRC, you know, the, the conditions are based on the nature of the case that that he was released from prison for, and you know, in part how often he has to report, you know, drug and alcohol analysis, or you know, no contact orders, or, or whatever it could be, the adult parole authority will impose conditions on on the offender based on the case that they had, they were in prison for, based on their behavior in prison, all, all sorts of all sorts of things, and letting that come in to a sex offense registration case, I think, was was far more prejudicial than probative. And I don't think a limited, limiting instruction is enough to cure you know, the prejudice to the jury. You know, well, regard. what we didn't find in the record was the question and answer such that it wasn't about whether or not he was in violation of his post-conviction um, yeah. obligations, or was it just, this is what I did, and here's why I would be the person who would be searching for him. But it, it did come out that he had not been reporting to his parole officer for quite some time, and that, I think, unfortunately, that, that, that's, that's prejudicial in, in, in the sense that it makes it sound like that Mr. Brewer just left the reservation and never come back ever again. And um, if you're living, no matter where you live, I mean, you can go on long trips somewhere. I mean, eventually he was apprehended in Boston. And, um, you know, there's nothing in the sex offense registration law that says you can't go on an odyssey across the country and go on a trip somewhere and eventually come back. There's nothing in the sex offender registration law that says you have to report your where your whereabouts on a daily basis, whether you're going to the grocery store, going to work, or you know, if you're gonna go, you know, to Texas or California to see friends or family. There's nothing in that law that says that he that anybody who's a registered sex offender has to tell the sheriff where they're going. It, they only have to tell the sheriff where they're living and they just have to keep their obligated to keep the sheriff updated as to where they're living. And if they do move, then they got to tell them about it. But here, they they found Mr. Brewer in Boston. But when the landlord went to he went into his residence and, and found his personal belongings were still there, his bed was still there, his clothes were still there, his dressers, and then also his food was still in the refrigerator. He I didn't. Was, move. I was unclear about that. Was he evicted? No. Was he given notice of eviction? The, the landlord was had the intention of evicting him because Mr. Brewer fell behind on his rent, but the landlord had not engaged in any eviction proceedings. He did not file any lawsuits in, in the municipal court to evict Mr. Brewer. So the landlord 
did state that he had the intention to evict him, and which was why he entered the premises. But Mr. Brewer's belongings were still there. So if Mr. Brewer had the intention of moving somewhere else or, or relocating somewhere else, certainly he would have most likely have taken his stuff with him. Is there some testimony regarding conversations between Mr. Brewer and the landlord about use, use of the security deposit and some sort of informal agreement that he could move out? I do not specifically recall that, to be quite honest. Um, what I, what I do recall and what I do have written up in my brief is the fact that when the landlord, the landlord had, did have the intention to evict Mr. Brewer, he did fall behind on his rent, but you know that in of itself is not unusual. I mean, lots of people fall behind on their rent, and they still live there. In fact, and I believe you know the as far as when it comes to eviction law, they they still live there until the day that they are forced out, until the bailiff of the municipal court would come over and say it's time to go. Um, and the landlord had not filed any eviction proceedings in the local municipal court, and he, he may have had the intention to, but he had not until, so until he actually carried through with, with eviction, Mr. Brewer still lived at that address, and so his registration with the sheriff was current and was accurate, and he did not violate any, any registration laws. And there, there, might, there might have been issues in terms of his reporting to the PRC to, a PRC to, a, to a parole officer, but that's a completely separate matter, and that would not warrant an indictment for failure to register. Well, the other thing I didn't see anywhere was, is there anything in the transcript that would indicate how long he was actually in Boston? Yeah, we don't know. Um, no. I don't, nobody knows. Um, nobody exactly knows where he went to first, or if he did go anywhere first, whether he, or how he got there, or like that, whether he hitchhiked or took a train, flew, Nobody knows that that evidence. There was no evidence ever presented as to how he ended up in Boston or where he may have traveled to prior to that or how long. All we know that he was in Boston and he was found there, and then that um, that he was apprehended there. Um, so without any evidence of as to how or why he got there, I don't think there's anything to be inferred other than just that he just went on a trip. I mean, it, anybody can go on a trip anywhere, and there's nothing in the registration law that says. You must stay here at your, at your residence at all times. You can only leave to go to work or go to the grocery store. There, there's no there's no conditions or restrictions on that. I'm talking about if you're gone for more than two weeks, or if you plan to be out of town for a month. You have no, it, 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 like it, there, there's there's nothing in the law that that, that, <laughs> that restricts anybody from going on a, on a long vacation. And, that, that, and that's where, and I think that's that's, there's, that's an area where the legislature's going to probably have to clarify because I mean there's people who who live part-time in Ohio, part-time in Florida, you know, or sometimes they, they go on a work assignment and they, they get sent somewhere that they, they could get sent to Europe for a month on a work assignment. So does that mean that they've moved? It, it, there, there's, there's all kinds of questions, I think, this, that, that go beyond this case regarding the registration law and how, how broad and, and vague it is. And, um, and I think without any evidence as to how Mr. Brewer got to Boston or how long he was there or why he was there, I don't think there's anything that can be inferred from other than the fact that he just went on a trip, and that and, and with his, belong, his personal belongings still remaining at the house, that that's where he still lived. And so, and I think in that regard, the evidence of him failing to register, I think I believe, is insufficient, and to that end, the conviction should be overturned. Um, I do want to touch, and then also and for the same reasons, um, if the sufficiency argument were to fail, I've also argued in my brief that the, the testimony of the PRC, of the parole officer about his PRC reporting, I believe, was unduly prejudicial, and that would in and of itself warrant a new trial, because that, like I explained earlier, the PRC reporting conditions are much different than registration with the sheriff for sex offender registration purposes. So um, introducing testimony of a parole officer was unduly was Unduly prejudicial, far more prejudicial than probative, and that should warrant a reversal of itself, at least for a new trial. I will go further and say that they didn't even introduce evidence that he even moved, any sufficient evidence that Mr. Brewer had relocated the residence. Um, well, they don't the, have the burden to show that, right, under the law, that he moved? Yeah, the state had the burden. They just have the burden to show that he no longer resides where he's registered. The, the state had the burden to show that he no longer lives there. Right. But 
I think it, it, but they're going to show that he no longer lives there. When he's got his, his, his belongings, personal belongings, and his food still there, it, there's got to be more additional evidence beyond that. It, it's, it's one thing if they were to go to his, his residence and find that he took that, he is gutted, none of his belongings are there, it's all empty. That's one thing. But the fact that his belongings were still there, to me, that, that shows that he had the intent to come back. And um, and so for the, the state does have the burden to show more, they have to introduce more evidence that would indicate as to, well, why was he gone? Where did he go? How long did he go? Did he, did he, was he looking to stay in Boston permanently? I mean, You're just now reaching into that five minutes of rebuttal. Okay, thank you. and I represent the appellate of the state of Ohio in this matter. Uh, first, with regard to the sufficiency arguments um, here, the state was required to, to prove a change of address, and to find, that is defined in 2950.05i as any circumstance in which an old address for the person in question is no longer accurate. It doesn't sh sh state that the state has to prove that he moved or he had some sort of an intent to come back or anything like that, but that this address is no longer accurate for this particular offender. Um, in this case, the landlord, it, it, Mr. Rines, who is his parole officer, stated that for a six-week period in April and March of, of that year, 2013, March and April of 2013, that he was sending correspondence to this address that uh, Mr. Brewer was registered at and was receiving no, no um, correspondence back or no response. From there, um, he learned that he was in Boston. It was at that point then the deputy who was in charge of dealing with the registered sex offenders then went out to this address and talked to the landlord. And from there, she learned that from him um, that he had been evicted. And the landlord here actually did testify. He stated that Mr. Brewer was failing to pay his rent, and he was going to—he was starting the process of eviction. Um, however, he stopped the process because he and Mr. Brewer came to an agreement with regard to him using the security deposit that he provided, so that he would stay one extra month, and then then after that he would be gone. And what month is that? That would have been—I believe they, it was April that. Um, he failed to make his rent, so it would have been for that month of April that he was using the security deposit because the landlord stated that as of May 3rd, 2013, Mr. Brewer was actually gone. What, at what point did the landlord enter into the premises of his testimony? I know that he then, in June of 2013, went into the residence and actually got rid of whatever was left of Mr. Brewer's items out of the apartment. So. Um, Brewer was gone the May 3rd, and then in June is when he, when uh, the landlord actually took all the items out. And what, at what point, and I apologize, I know this is in the record, but no, it's fine. at what point, at what date did the deputy speak with the landlord? Um, I don't know the exact date that she actually spoke to the landlord. I knew I would find a date you didn't know. <laughs> I apologize, Your Honor. <laughs> but I know that he was um, indicted, I believe, in May. He was indicted in May. I believe so. It says on May so. in, the, in the brief, it says on May 30, 2013, Detective Gilbert went back to the address and learned that he'd been evicted from that address. So that it, would, there, that it would have been at the end of May, May then. Okay. Sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Um, and the actual facts of this case are pretty similar to a case out of the 7th District, State versus Green. In that case, there was also a parole officer who had testified that he went out to the address of the, um, his parole lady, who was also re required to register as a sex offender. He found out from the sister that uh, Green had not been at the residence for quite some time. They also had testimony from the person who was actually living at the address stating that she had lived there for a week and Green had not been there. Um, and that um, the, sheriff's, the sheriff who was in 
in charge of the registration also testified that um, he, Green was uh, aware that he had to provide notice of any sort of change of arrest, but he failed to do so. Um, and here we have similar circumstances. Again, um, the parole officer testified that he tried to make contact with him at this address and was unable to do so. The landlord testified that uh, Mr. Brewer had been evicted. Um, and furthermore, there was testimony that Brewer was aware of the fact that he was required to provide any sort of change of address and he failed to do so. And under those circumstances, the state, um, in State versus Green, the Seventh District Court of Appeals found that there was, in fact, sufficient evidence to support uh, a conviction for failure to register. Um, now, with regard to whether or not Mr. Ryan's testimony was um, more pro uh, prejudicial than probative, um, his testimony um, shows that Mr. Brewer was not at this address. Um, in support of his failing to change the address, that he tried to make contact there, um, was not getting any sort of response. Furthermore, there was in fact a, a limiting instruction by the trial court to the jury. And the trial court said that this testimony was solely to be considered in context of Mr. Brewer's failure to register as a sex offender had, it's not to be used to have some sort of inference that because he wasn't, um, reporting with his parole officer that, that somehow inferred that he was not um, up to date with his registration requirements. What was the objection at trial regarding um, Mr. Ryan's testimony? I believe it was in the context of how it was, and I could be incorrect, but I believe it was in the context of how it's kind of argued here that he was testifying with regard to you know, him being in parole and somehow that, that it was more prejudicial and probative of him failing to register. Um, and when a, a, a trial court does in fact provide such a limiting instruction, um, the jury is presumed to follow that instruction. And here the state would argue that the trial court provided an appropriate um, instruction to limit the testimony solely to whether or not Mr. Brewer was in fact um, registering or failing to register um, his address and as such the jury did in fact follow that instruction and limited to the facts of the case and what it was required to find. Um, thus uh, the state would request um, that the, this honorable court uphold uh, the conviction and sentence of Mr. Brewer um, that was found by the jury in this matter. If there are no further questions, thank you. Thank you, Honors. Thank you, Honor. Um, to bring up a point about why was he in Boston or anything like that. I think it doesn't need to be noted that the record does reflect that Mr. Brewer has an issue with mental illness. And so, you know, and I think it's all the more reason as to when people may ask, well, why would he leave his belongings there? Or why would he stay in Boston or anything like that? You know, given his struggle with mental illness, um, there may not be exactly be a good reason why. And, you know, it, and I don't think there's anything that can be inferred other than, you know, what other than the fact that he just went on a trip to Boston and um, the prosecutor did not introduce any evidence as to why he was there, how long, and you know, whether he intended to come back or anything like that. And, and so he may have had this agreement with the landlord to use a security deposit to um, you know, pay for an extra month, but you know, again, given, you know, given his struggle with mental illness and his behaviors and, and things like that, um, he may have just very well decided, you know what, I think I'm going to stay here for a little while. Maybe go on a trip to Boston. Again, may not, there may not be a good reason why, but it, it is what it is. And so, you know, we have to look at the evidence for what it is. And the, the state did not present any evidence that he vacated his residence and with the intention of never coming back. You know, he, again, he left his belongings there, and he, um, you know, and he had he had his food still there. And so absent of any other evidence, we have to presume that that's where he was still living. 
and he would just merely go on a trip, and that's it. So, um, and if I can quickly just touch on the speedy trial issue, uh, before the trial started, his attorney did object to the trial going forward. He did motion for dismissal based on speedy trial violation, and that was a rule by the trial court. Um, I think the trial court should have considered the fact that um, with the number of days that passed, you know, he signed one of those boilerplate waivers, which you know I attacked in the past and in a prior case with Dave versus Velez, and then I'm attacking, attacking him in this case too. Um, the, the trial court uses these boilerplate entries that will say, at the defendant's request, this the trial date set for here, which infers the tolling. They also have the preprint language of the defendant waives statutory speedy trial, and um, and I think you know those those forms present a lot of problems because every single pretrial those forms are presented for the defendant. For the defendant to sign, and, um, and knowing the way things, you know, practice is done here, um, there is often a lot of um, pressure, if you will, from the prosecutors and the courts to have the defendant sign because it makes the, their scheduling a lot easier. And but ultimately, it is the defendant's right; it is the defendant's call. And Ms. Uh, Mr. Brewer is represented by counsel throughout this proceeding, correct? Correct. So at some point or any point after he signed that form waiving the speedy trial rights, he could have um, changed his mind and filed the appropriate paperwork. Well, in his rescind that. His okay. second attorney, you know, I believe he changed attorneys. Some, his second attorney, who ultimately tried the case, though, Mr. Darling, did file a withdrawal of the waiver. Um, and but my my belief is that those waivers should not be enforced. I mean, and, that, and that's because of the nature of the form, because the way the, the, the pre-printed language on the forms are so slanted against the defendant. And if, if, if they want a defendant, if the defendant's going to waste speedy trial, all they have to do is present one form, one time, and where he's advised as to, okay, you have a right to a speedy trial, you know, you, you, know, you can waive it if you want to. And, and, and it only needs to be done one time, but it's like every single pre-trial that comes up. And but it's represented by counsel. He is, and, but oftentimes, like, I can just tell you from my own experience, it's oftentimes like, you know, especially if the lawyers have multiple clients that they're seeing in, in, in the pre-trials and stuff, so on and so forth, it's like, okay, here, sign this, you can go, come back on this date. That, that is oftentimes what happens. And then as a result, and then the, and then the court likes that signature because it shows that the defendant was present, they don't have to worry about sending the KPS out or anything like that, they know he showed up. And so, there's got to be some separation between, you know, taking note that the defendant appeared and they don't have any issues with bond versus if they, if they want to waive speedy trial, then it can be done in a separate form and that can be something that the defendant and his or her attorney can talk about and go over and decide. Well, even if you, even if there's a separate form and you sign it at your initial hearing waiving speedy trial, at some point down the road, if you decide you don't want to waive it, now you do still have to file something to rescind that, wouldn't you? I didn't quite get the last part of your question. You would still have to file something to rescind your approval of speed yes. trial waiver, and yes. at some point, and, and at some that, point that, you're going to have to file something. He, he, and he did, and his, his second attorney did do that on um, December for, the 6th, I believe. December 6th of 2013, they did rescind the waiver. But didn't ask for a trial. Yes, and, it found, and he stayed in jail the entire time until he finally went to trial in late February of 2014. Um, and that's and that's, a, that's another argument I, I'm making is that I believe that the amount of time that passed with him sitting in jail was unreasonable. If you were to add up the amount of time he sat in jail outside of the waiver period, if, if that waiver were to be enforced, it adds up to um, 97 days in jail, and then times three would come out to about 281 days. You no, know, no, three, 300. No. Yeah, 291 days, which is excess of 270. Regretfully, I need to inform you that you lie all of your rebuttal time as well. Thank, Thank you, you for your presentations this morning. The court will take the matter under advisement, issue a written decision, which will be mailed to both sides as well as posted on the House Supreme Court website. Thank, Thank you. you. We are adjourned.